Yeah, well, of course, then you've got, uh, unfortunately, you've got, you know, some people uh, who are, you know, have, have or are planning to, you know, to uh, announce their run for the presidency here in the United States in 2016, who are uh, at least, you know, publicly, you know, uh, disavowing any kind of belief in the concept of climate change and global warming and, and things like that. And I guess, and, and not to, well, I'm going to reveal my politics here. I think the whole problem can be summed up by one word, and it's uh, K-O-C-H, but... <laughs> uh, that that's you know they, they have a uh, they have a vested interest in perpetuating uh, the use of petroleum and petroleum related products and things. Well, look, let's since since I've been covering this thing, um, I get well. Let, let, let me let me talk instead about uh, about one of the things when I when I, I had the opportunity to go to Japan in two thousand seven to see the third generation Toyota Prius before it was made public, uh, along with another small group of, of journalists. And we also got to do the, the Tokyo Auto Show. And one of the things that struck me in walking to the Tokyo Auto Show was the prominence of TEPCO uh -huh. in that show where you've got, uh, and you mentioned, of course, Mitsubishi's involvement, you mentioned Subaru's involvement, and those, and I got to actually see those early prototypes. In fact, I got to drive one of the early pre-production models of the uh, IMEV uh, there at, at, at the show. And, and of course, I had, and this is where the revelatory part of your book comes in, I had no idea of what that relationship of TEPCO was to the whole sort of EV movement. Could you touch on that? And, of course, the thing that really makes this sink home is the fact that um, TEPCO, TEPCO and the gentleman who was driving this was also responsible, I don't know if he still is or not, is responsible for trying to figure out what to do with the mess at Fukushima. So maybe right. give us give us a sense of that, if you would. Well, so so one of the key characters of the book is named Takafumi Anagawa. And Takafumi Anagawa was a brilliant nuclear scientist. And he was kind of different from most Japanese people. Japanese have an inherent distrust of nuclear technology. And that really dates back to the end of World War II, yeah. when the United States bombed Japan with two nuclear weapons. Yeah. Um, but, but Anagawa was different. Anagawa saw nuclear power as a solution to climate change, other environmental concerns, and industrial competitiveness. And as a result, in the early 2000s, when California started to reorient towards fuel cells, and when the Bush administration started to oppose California's efforts to drive the industry towards electrification, Anagawa got this idea, completely you know, separate from the rest of the industry, that TEPCO should start promoting electric vehicles. And so as the German and other Japanese and American automakers all started to slow down and reorient their research and development edifice towards fuel cells and you know, other things that didn't necessarily have to do with more environmental vehicles, TEPCO pushed forward and started to look for partners amongst the Japanese automakers. And the partners that they found were not the partners that you would necessarily right. expect. Yeah. Um, they're Mitsubishi and Subaru. And they worked long and hard to create a viable electric vehicle ecosystem. And they did. And that's where Chadamo comes right. from. That's where the next generation of electric vehicles really started. And they convinced Japan's government to put very generous incentives into the industry. And that is really what turned the heads of the people back in California and made them say, hey, you know what, this EV thing, it's ready. We're going to go back to the drawing board and we're going to reassert our authority in driving the whole global automotive industry towards an electric future because we see that the technology is ready for prime time. And so you see, these are global stories. You can't yeah. really understand them if you just look at Washington or if you just look at Detroit or California. You have to take a much broader view. Yeah, well, you have, there is a link. You know, I mentioned that Europe is not, does not play a prominent role in the book, but there is a direct linkage there because the uh, at least two, if I recall correctly, of the people that are, were overseeing the development of China's electric Great Leap forward uh, were in fact, uh, while they were Chinese, native Chinese, were educated and trained in Europe with the large car manufacturers. That's exactly right. So China's Minister of 
science and technology, Wang Gong was a brilliant guy who ended up going to grad school in Germany and working for Audi. And he came up with this idea for the Chinese to leapfrog past the era of internal combustion engines. Right. And he did that as he was an executive at, at the Audi Motor Company. The way that that idea percolated into the Chinese policy system was that one of Wang Gong's other responsibilities was to tour visiting dignitaries through Audi facilities. And so when the then Minister of Science and Technology, Xu Guanhua, came to Audi to tour the facility, Wang Gong started to sell him on this idea of leapfrogging. Mm, yeah. And they loved the idea so much back in China, um, not just Xu Guanghua, but the other leaders of the Chinese Communist Party, that they brought Wang Gong back to China. They made him president of one of China's most pre prestigious universities. And eventually, um, this automotive engineer, who was not a member of the Chinese Communist Party, was made Minister of Science and Technology. And that was a huge deal. That, that was kind of unprecedented. Yeah. What was the most surprising thing that you discovered in this book that just sort of, wow, I had no idea that that would be the situation or are these people? What, what, what grabbed you the most? I think Wang Gong is a pretty compelling character. Okay. I mean, his whole, his whole narrative arc, you know, when he was 14 years old, he was banished to the countryside as part of the Cultural Revolution. Yeah, yeah. He had nothing to do, and so he spent his days trying to modernize the primitive little village that he lived in. He built an electrical grid, and then he would spend long nights in the tractor shed disassembling and reassembling the engine, trying to get a better understanding of how internal combustion worked. And yeah. after that, you know, he went off to Germany, and this whole saga that I just yeah. described played out. Um, and, and he brought back this incredible vision of what could be in China. And then you saw the vision kind of launch and then collapse spectacularly. And I think that it, it's a terrific sort of, it's a terrific tale of the importance of chance and kismet, but also in getting policy right. And you know, how when you get the policy right, incredible things can happen. And when you unleash the power of markets yeah. and you channel them in a positive direction, then markets can work for society. Yeah. But if you, if you fail to channel markets adequately, they just don't work very well. And so the interesting thing now is that China is learning. And in the end of 2013, they recalibrated a bunch of their policies. They actually yeah. had some seminars with the California Air Resource Board where they talked to them and they asked them to tell the Chinese leadership how they were incentivizing growth in their domestic EV market. And then China didn't copy California's policies exactly, but they took a lot of the concepts from California and they started to apply them to a new generation of policies. And this year, California um, is still growing, but China's electric vehicle market is surging. And yeah. the reason why is because China has increased the competition within its domestic market, and it has also instituted mandates for, for fleet purchases of government vehicles. And, um, and so I think that China's not out. I think China's surging back in the great race, and that you know, we're going to have to run hard if we want to stay competitive. Yeah, well, I, I don't want to give, obviously give away the book because it's just jam-packed with, with uh, information, and particularly you know, an analysis of their policies and, and how that nearly brought about the, you know, the collapse of this great leap forward. So what's next for you? Besides you, you've got, uh, you know, you've got this fellowship that you're working on. Well, I'm, I'm here at New America right now, and I'm looking at autonomous vehicles. I'm, okay. I'm really interested in applying some of the concepts that I have, you know, come to understand through my research on electric vehicles and driving innovation in that space to autonomous vehicles and, and trying to understand what kinds of policy prerequisites we have to put in place in order to make sure that we can harness the um, efficiency and the environmental benefits and the safety benefits of autonomous vehicles as well. Because I think that we're, I think we're really at a fulcrum in the history of transportation right now. You know, we are moving from a system that is very inefficient, it's based on mass production, and it's driven by oil, 
to a system that is right-sized in terms of capital, that is much more efficient in terms of the way that we use energy and the way that we use space and the way that we use time, and, and is really driven by a diverse set of sources of energy that, that are turned into electricity and then fed into our, our vehicles in, in, in various ways. And I think it's really, it's, it's an exciting time to be in the yeah, transportation space. I, I had an interesting thought, yes, I think it was yesterday when I was driving. Um, I got to thinking about what if the, there was an older car ahead of me in the thing and I got to thinking, you know what, what's going to happen when we start to see these autonomous vehicles on, on the road? And I, and I thought, you know, what would really be helpful is that because there's going to be so few of them initially, um, <coughs> excuse me, and that the transition from old, you know, manually driven vehicles over to autonomous vehicles is going to take, I'm sure, a generation uh, yeah. at least to do, that, that we should have some kind of way to identify an autonomous vehicle from a regular vehicle. As as I'm driving along, so I know if I look in my rearview mirror, it's either autonomous or, and maybe that's just simply some type of sensor, but I was thinking maybe the easiest way was some type of just light system, you know, on the vehicle that, you know, if the blue light is on, it's it's in autonomous mode, you know, and if the blue mm -hmm. light's off, then, you know, it, the, the person's manually driving it. So I sort that's... of know what's happening around me and maybe can kind of sense you know, not only you're sort of promoting the idea of autonomous vehicles, but you've given everybody a heads up that you've got this other vehicle that you're sharing the road with now that's being driven by a computer. Uh, as opposed that's a really to, good idea. Yeah. So can I patent yeah, that? There, or? <laughs> there's a big deal between a distracted driver and a driver who is checking his email because the car is driving for him. Right? Yeah, so yeah, yeah it's, exactly. It's useful to be able to know which one it is. Exactly. Very much yeah. so. Yeah. Um, so... In this race, do we have any clear-cut winners, and when will they be announced? Well, I think we definitely have a company that has really changed the game, and that company is Tesla. Of course, you know, yeah. Tesla was the, it, it was the single actor that changed public perceptions of what an electric car could yeah. be. And what they were doing wasn't necessarily completely original. You know, we both know that Al Cocconi had been working with fast electric cars right. before Elon Musk you know, had yeah. any idea what an electric vehicle was. Right. But that said, they took the technology from Al Cocconi and they translated it into a product that at first was desirable just from a novelty standpoint, but now is, you know, arguably the best car ever made. And, and that's pretty phenomenal. Yeah. So, so I think Tesla is a winner, but this is a race that goes on, and it's a race that you you can't rest or you'll fall behind. So yeah. I, I think that uh, it's it's premature to declare winners and losers, but you can say that that Tesla is a pretty revolutionary company, and they did change the rules of the game. They absolutely did. I actually had an opportunity to drive the uh, T zero once upon a time, and then of course, really, yeah, and then of course an early prototype of the. Uh, uh, the Roadster. So, uh, so yeah. So it's it's been a fun ride, and it absolutely Tesla has uh, has certainly changed the game. Look, well, what thank was the ride in T zero like? Uh, oh boy, yeah. it's, it, it it was it was quick. It was fun, but again, like all sports cars, it's just too hard to get in and out. Of. <laughs> I'm, all right. I guess, I'm, I guess I'm, a, I'm a big sedan guy, you know, or, or better yet, I just ride my electric bicycle. That's really easy to get in and out of. You know, you should try the Toyota Mirai. It is a very comfortable car that is yeah. easy to get in and out of. Yeah, I, yeah well, I, I, got, yeah, I, got to, I got to sit in it at the Detroit Auto Show, so yeah, it, uh, I could see it's that. It's comfy. Yeah. 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 Um, I'm, 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 I'm sort of one of those people who withholds judgment on fuel cells because I don't quite see it, but I know there are a lot of really smart people who do. Yeah. But I will say... The seats in the Mirai are very comfortable. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> now just now just now just find a place to fuel it and you'll be a happy camper, right? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, all you have to do is find a place to gas up. Good. Now, okay, so let's pitch the book here. Where can they find a copy and uh, how much will it cost them? Well, uh, you can find it at Barnes and Noble at most okay. major bookstores, uh, on Amazon, Barnes and Noble on online. 
Um, and books I, and and I will hold it up again so people can see a copy of it. Thank you very much. It's, it's called The Great Race. And I think the, the cover price is $28, but it sells for less than that if you buy it online. So, right. so um, I would love for you to buy it. And anyone who does, uh, please feel free to send me a note and ask me questions. And uh, I'm, I'm happy to sign autographs as well. Oh, I may send this back to you and get an autograph then. <laughs> send me your address. <laughs> I'll send you a book plate, which has uh, my signature on it. It looks like the same thing, but nicer. All right. Will do. All right. Thank you. Uh, Levi, thank you so much for talking with us today. Thanks for having me on. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.